Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Trading Bell. My name is Malika Kazia. We are at the Stanbic Bank headquarters here in Nairobi and I want to speak to the Chief Finance Officer, Abraham Ongenge. And we're going to be discussing the results for quarter one of 2020 that have come out of Stanbic. And even as we get into the numbers, what are some of the strategies that the bank has already put in place to deal with COVID-19 and its impact on business? We'll find out much more than that, but first, do take a look at his profile. Abraham Ongenge is an accomplished business leader in the field of accounting and finance with more than 15 years experience in the banking and financial services industry. Mr. Ongenge is a graduate of the Advanced Management Program of Strathmore University and IESE School of Business, Barcelona, Spain. He has a Bachelor of Commerce First Class Honours degree from the university and a Certified Public Accountant of Kenya qualification. Abraham began his career with Stanbic Bank Limited as a financial accountant. He went on to develop his career within the Standard Bank Group, rising through various levels of management. He was instrumental as a finance lead in significant transactions for the Standard Bank Group, notably the acquisition of IBTC Bank in Nigeria, the merger of CFC Bank and Stanbic Bank in Kenya, and the successful restructure of shareholding in the group insurance entities to enable the merger of those entities from the banking business in Kenya. Abraham has worked in various capacities within the Standard Bank Group in Kenya and South Africa. Mr. Ongenge was appointed the Standard Bank Kenya Limited Chief Finance Officer in 2014. He is also a non-executive director of Stanbic Nominees and Stanbic Insurance Agency Limited. Abraham, thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you very much. So let's get into, you know, the general uh, banking industry right now because the KBA survey that came out recently says 94% of banks expect that they're going to be adversely affected by the virus. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, banking is really a reflection of the clients we serve and we have seen several distress in some of our clients both on the household areas, on the tourism sector, on the manufacturing sector and also on the real estate. So we do reflect that back into um, our banking sector performance. And while we see some of this distress starting to manifest in this COVID period, we also do expect that we will try and support our customers in this way. And in some way, that would mean that um, our revenues would, would show some stress. So, of course, we do know that uh, CBK, as well as the government, have implemented measures when it comes to loans and things like that to cushion Kenyans. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about the results that came out for between mm. January to March 2020. Uh, you reported a 1.5 billion profit after tax. And if we compare it to the previous year's similar period, that was at 2.3 billion, I believe. So about a 33% slump. Um, tell me more about, you know, this particular particular reduction, especially you did cite falling interest income as one of the reasons. Yeah, um, we actually did begin the, the year with some central bank rate cuts. Um, from a quarter perspective, 175 basis points cut uh, year on year compared to where we were in, in the first quarter of 2019. Now, this has had an impact because we've reflected that benefit into our clients' loans and advances, and it has led to a reduction in net interest income. But having said that, um, I think what is pleasing is that our customer deposits were up um, about uh, 12%. Our customer loans were up about uh, 6%, which kind of shows that we continue to support our customers and we continue to grow the business. Okay, this uh, falling interest income that you uh, cited as well during the results period, uh, you know, when it comes to correlation to the lifting of the rate cap, what sort of effect has that had? So the lifting of the rate, rate cap allowed us to price well for, for risk for new loans going forward. Uh, the law clarified that the existing loans will still remain pegged to the central bank rate until they uh, finish repayment. So for the loans that were still pegged to the central bank rate, we still applied the benefit of the rate cut. But we also are conscious around the new loans and we continue to price them, reflecting some of the indications we see in the market around general decrease in interest rates. 
So there was always there was that skepticism that you know it it's going to lead to banks hiking interest rates to up to twenty percent and more. Uh, what what's your take on that? On the contrary, I think the benefit that the lifting of interest rate caps has given banks is to be able to differentiate good credit and and bad credit. And in some cases, we've seen clients who are actually willing to meet their obligations to pay, and we've reflected that benefit in the rates that we, we charge them. For clients who are a little bit more riskier, we would be able to then differentiate them with the slightly higher interest rates. But we also take into account the fact that there's been a general decrease in interest rates, just looking at the trends of the treasury bills and treasury bonds. So that means that the general decrease also reflects in how we price going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, of course, the increase in customer deposits and also a growing loan book uh, as well. So how has the virus affected loan uptake? So we've seen a slowdown in loan uptake, especially on, uh, with, with households. But we've also seen sectors that are actually seeing some benefits uh, coming to us to request for investments so that they will be able to digitize more. They will be able to access more financing to do some of the trade finance that they, that they do need to do. So in areas we found winners, people who actually have opportunity within this period, but we've also have had people who have taken a much more, um, a much more cautious approach in their financing decisions. So which sort of sectors have you seen actually, you know, as emerges winners, so to speak? So the ICT sector is actually coming out as, as winners. The e-commerce space um, showing some, some winning elements there. We've, we have telcos who uh, are actually doing, uh, doing quite well. Uh, there are elements of food processing, um, which is doing quite, quite well, and some pockets of retail, especially distribution. Mm. Uh, there are areas where we have seen a little bit of stress around the automotive uh, industry, the tourism sector, obviously because of the um, travel restrictions, yes. the areas of transport because of restricted movements. Those ones we've seen a little bit of stress. Okay. Uh, also, when it comes to the credit score and then access to loans, what sort of changes have there been? Because we, of course, had seen the directive when it came to credit scores, but what has the you know, re uh, repercussion kind of been like? Yeah. The first thing that uh, we've done as Stanbic is to almost realize that COVID is not something that was planned for by both households and corporates and, and businesses. So the one thing we've done is to allow our customers to adjust to the new normal. Uh, and one of the things we've changed is we've allowed our customers holidays. For individuals, we've allowed up to one month holidays. Okay. For SMEs, we've allowed up to three month holidays uh, to almost enable them reposition their businesses and rethink about how do they then uh, operate in the new normal uh, post-COVID and within the, within the COVID period. So we continue to interact with our customers to understand their specific needs. So from a credit score perspective, it has become a little bit more individual, more, more, more specific, but also trying to factor in the forward-looking type information around where we see stresses. So I believe you've restructured loans worth about 10.9 billion to individuals thus far. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, recently the CBK also came out to say that the banking industry in general, about close to 82 billion uh, or so worth of loans have been restructured. But of course, that was at that point. I'm sure now it's even grown further. Uh, what kind of impact does this have on the bank's uh, profitability? So when you restructure the loans, uh, you effectively... Uh, allow your customers to delay some of their payment obligations yes. until they are able to then reposition their businesses or their households to resume to resume payment. So there's an element around uh, liquidity that then would impact uh, would impact banks. We do have to put some foresight around the fact that some of our customers may come to us and are unable to pay. So we may need to partner with them for a much longer period of, uh, of dis distress. That would mean that we provide a little bit uh, more for, for, for the loans. But we also see an impact around uh, capital. So we do need to make capital available to support some of these, uh, these restructures. I think we've seen a lot of opportunity as an organization to liaise with some of our partners to provide funding to match some of the 
tenors that we are looking to reposition these loans at. We've also had uh, seen a lot of liquidity inflow into, into our business with almost 12% uh, deposit growth. So we are quite confident that we are able to support our customers during this period. When it comes to the uh, workforce, as uh, we were just chatting before we began that you know you've got about 47 percent of your workforce working from home uh, what has that been like in its impact on the operations it's actually been uh, very interesting some of the anecdotal feedback we receive is that our 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 employees are actually more productive mm. um, working from home because it gives them a balance between um, having their families available and also uh, supporting the organization to uh, to grow. There are definitely risks that we are we have to be much more aware of. Uh, some of these risks have to deal with information security and our ability to protect the information of our customers. Uh, cyber security becomes something that becomes quite topical yes. in an area where most of your staff um, are working from home. But We've also seen that dis disposable income for our, for our employees is increasing because they now do not need to spend on fuel to come from home to, to, to work. In the new normal, do you see that you, know, you will maybe in the future actually keep that strategy for certain functions of the company so certain employees maybe will continue that sort of uh, work from home system maybe? There is definitely positives that we would want to retain um, into the future. There's a lot of very good learning that can be accessed digitally which we would want to sustain. There is um, very good opportunity around how we meet and how we communicate digitally across the, the continent uh, as being Standard Bank um, as, part of, uh, as part of the African continent. Uh, so some of those things we will, we will retain. Definitely there is a new norm around how sitting spaces in offices look like and that may require a little bit more of social distancing. Considering that uh, COVID is now thought to be an endemic rather than an, a pandemic. So it's something that we we'll probably would need to live with for, for quite some time. So some level of social distancing will have to be rethought of. So we do need to think about a percentage of our staff having to work from home or offsite and a percentage of our staff being in the office. Okay. Uh, when it comes to COVID again, investments under your COVID-19 combating strategy through the Stanbic Bank Foundation, I believe, surpassed about 137 million. So expound a little bit about this and tell me more about, you know, what your initiative is currently doing. Yeah, so through, through various partners and in, in collaboration with some of the some of the banking entities that we have out of uh, out of Kenya we have been able to procure about 192 ventilators uh, this would actually be quite helpful in kind of assisting the people who will be adversely affected by the COVID-19 disease we have issued uh, washing stations, about 700 of them, through our partnership with the Rotary Cl Club, and we'll be distributing them across across countries, ac across counties. We have um, about a thousand uh, personal protective equipment that we have procured, uh, and through our partnership with doctors, we are going to supply that. Uh, to, to the doctors who are fighting this disease and well done to them uh, by w working on the front line to try and help uh, improve the health conditions in this, in this country. Um, we're also going further in seeking funding for our SMEs uh, to enable them ride through this period and even after the period to kind of boost their recovery process mm -hmm. uh, during the period using the foundation. Amazing. Uh, you know, as we even continued that discussion about COVID-19 and uh, what you're doing, what would you like to see the government implement in terms of cushioning SMEs right now? You know, we've seen, of course, they've given different measures here and there, uh, tax-wise uh, as well. But when it comes to SMEs particularly, what would your recommendations be for perhaps what more they can actually put in place? Yeah, and I have to say we've seen we've seen pockets of good things, but things that I think we can enhance. One of it is uh, we do need to start promoting the made in Kenya um, 
aspect of how we then promote our SMEs. There are a lot of these protective equipment that can be produced in, in Kenya and we've seen brilliance in uh, ventilators. We do need to support such kind of process. We do need to think about how do we procure in Kenya because it's probably the new normal mm -hmm. that there will be a little bit more restrictions globally. So we do need to promote some of our SMEs to be the innovators of, um, of, of tomorrow. I do think there is a little bit more we can do around the stimulus from a funding perspective. Um, as banks, we can help a little bit more in uh, enabling and creating capacity to ensure that some of these SMEs actually recover quite, uh, uh, quite fast. But we do need some level of guarantee funding uh, coming through from, uh, uh, from the government. It's quite positive, the tax measures that uh, have been have been put in place, but I think it is also important that we provide access to access to market, and some of the linkages that the government can create around converting the airlines into cargo airlines to enable our SMEs a continue exporting without necessarily being physically there would be some of the things that we'd want to see to kind of support this economy rebound. Okay, and the private sector's role then in uh, facilitating, you know, these kinds of moves. What, what, what more would you like to see from that end? Yeah, and I think more and more as we kind of reflect on this pandemic, there's a definite question and challenge that comes out of the private sector around innovation for good rather than innovation for. Uh, for, for, for profit. And I think there are brilliant minds in, uh, in the private sector that can help around innovation for good. It is quite uh, pleasing to see how various uh, private sector firms have come to offer contributions towards the fight over, over the pandemic, but it also requires an investment to kind of build the distribution around the various uh, private sector entities to enable some of these uh, small entities uh, grow. So I would want to see more private sector uh, procuring more uh, from, from, from local communities. I would want to see private sectors investing a little bit more on uh, ensuring that education can be digitized. I think we've had about five million uh, uh, children are still not in, in, in school and not able to access learning. I would want a little bit more uh, investment in that. So if we can try and enhance our health sector, if we can try and build capacity in, in education, if we can try and improve our distributorship, I think we'll be moving in the right direction. So a lot of capacity building that needs to be focused on from the private side. Yeah. And uh, finally, you know, what future strategies do we expect from Stanbake plans we expect to see um, in the following quarters, even as we wrap up? Yeah, and um, I think what's pleasing our agenda is to say that um, there's a lot of stories um, in the media and discussions around responding to this pandemic. Um, I think at Stanbic we see that it is high time that we actually rebound uh, from, this, from this pandemic. So we are looking at areas where we can support our women uh, a little bit more. I think our women, while they've remained resilient, uh, they are probably one of the most affected in this in this pandemic, and we do have a data pro uh, proposition that's going to add a little bit more around capacity building, do a little bit more fin non financial support, and help women access funding much faster to enable us uh, rebound. I think the other piece is the piece around trade. Um, one of the things that um, I think would be important in the new normal is how we can create uh, cross-border collaboration digitally. Mm. And I think it's a big opportunity for us to digitize our trade and our linkages in China, our linkages in other African countries, uh, in Europe and in the, in the US would enable us, uh, and uh, would enable us uh, help our customers access such, um, such markets. And then lastly, it's the innovation for good. Um, thinking about how do we create capacity for our SMEs so that our SMEs can be able to manage their businesses better during, um, during this period and also after the, the COVID endemic. Okay, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you very much and thank you for having me.
And there you go. We got a lot of insights into what to expect from Stanbic Bank Kenya, even in the coming quarters, especially when it comes to how procedures will be in the new normal, even as many companies begin to realize the fact that this pandemic is staying with us for much longer than anticipated and there are ways around it that they can operate at an optimal level. Well, join us next time on The Trading Bell for more interesting conversation and of course follow us on our social media handles that are appearing right here on your screen. I'm Malika Kazia. Thanks for watching.